you all for being here. We've got a full agenda and a couple of topics that uh, can sometimes generate some discussion. Um, and we do have a quorum. So uh, I'd like a, mo a motion to approve the minutes of February 4th. Representative Petersburg? Madam Chair, I also move. Thank you. Um, any corrections or discussion? Mm -hmm. If not, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. The motion's uh, approved and the minutes are uh, finalized. Um, we are going to start um, our day with some background from House Research on the production tax so that we have a little bit of background before we go into Representative Liz Lagarde's uh, taconite production tax bill. So welcome to the committee, Mr. Swanson, and uh, please give us some background. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, for the record, my name is Jared Swanson and I'm with House Research. Uh, so as Chair Loeffler uh, just mentioned, I'm going to give just a little bit of background information on the production tax before we uh, hear the first bill today. Uh, so mines and facilities used in the production of taconite are exempt from property taxes. In lieu of this tax, the mining industry pays a production tax uh, that's just levied on the tons of taxable taconite production um, over a three-year period. The money generated by the production tax is distributed to local governments uh, within the taconite relief area. So this tax is uh, calculated by multiplying a tax rate by a tax base. And the tax rate for this calculation is set in statute. And for uh, taxes that were distributed in 2018, uh, that tax rate was just over $2.70 per taxable ton. <coughs> this rate is indexed for inflation and for the... Um, for distributions in 2019, that tax rate will be just over $2.75 per taxable ton. The tax base uh, on which this rate is applied is a three-year average of taconite produced. And that three-year average is used just to smooth out some of the changes in taconite production and to keep the tax a little bit more stable. The state calculates the tax amounts and then notifies each uh, mining company of the amount that they need to pay. Uh, that production tax is then distributed to the local jurisdictions within the taconite relief area. And then one thing that I wanted to mention um, that goes into this uh, production tax is that there's also a state general fund payment into the tax and that is not set at a particular uh, dollar amount, instead it's tied to um, the, the production itself. So it's set at 22 cents per taxable ton. Um, the annual payment is made from the general fund and you can see in the, um, the table on the, you should have a handout in your packet that says the production tax overview. Um, looks a little bit like this and it has a, a table at the bottom. You can see over the last seven years what the uh, production tax total has been. And this table also shows the amount that was levied on the mining companies as well as the amount, this 22 cents per taxable ton that's paid by the general fund. Uh, and the, the total is given in the far column of the, the production tax for each of those distribution years. On the back of that same handout, uh, there's a, uh, a chart that looks like this. It shows the distribution of the production taxes in 2018. I'm going to talk a little bit about that just to wrap up here today. So this shows the, um, the distribution of the production tax into the different accounts that are, um, that are set up in statute. And these distributions are set by a, a complex formula that divides this tax amount uh, into each of these accounts. So you can see that for uh, 2018 distribution of the production tax, uh, the tax total just under $94 million. And the taxable tonnage uh, in that distribution year was just over 32 million tons. The table itself, um, the, the top row has some column headings. Um, you can see cities and townships, school districts, counties, et cetera. And these are um, kind of broad categories for different accounts that uh, receive money from the production tax. The total and the total dollar amount and the total uh, cents per taxable ton for each of those categories is given in the top box. And then more detail is given below. Um, you can see each, um, each of the areas where the production tax is distributed. You can see the cents per taxable ton uh, for that account as well as the dollar amount that that corresponds to for distributions in 2018. So some of these distributions that you see in this table are guaranteed at a certain dollar amount. 
others are not. Uh, and then some of these uh, accounts uh, have their cents per taxable ton tied to inflation. Uh, there are actually four accounts in statute that are tied to inflation, and those are the, uh, the Township Fund, the IRRRB indexed account, the Douglas J. Johnson Economic Prote Protection Trust Fund, and the Property Tax Relief account. So these four have that cents per taxable ton uh, shown in the box tied to inflation. So remember the, the overall tax rate for the production taxes is also indexed for inflation. Um, the cents per taxable ton for each of these distributions is as well. And then the last thing I want to, um, want to mention about these distributions is that once uh, all the statutorily required distributions are made from the, from the production tax total amount, uh, there's typically a remainder or, or some dollar amount over uh, the amounts that are required to go into each of these accounts. And this remainder amount is distributed into two of the accounts that are shown on this back page, uh, one of them being the Taconite Environmental, Environmental Protection Fund and the Douglas J. Johnson Economic Protection Trust Fund. Um, and then the last thing I'll mention here is that the, the house file that you're about to hear, uh, hear about, House File 324, uh, will be making changes to the Taconite Municipal Aid Account and you can find that on the far left column about halfway down. So it's under the, the cities and townships heading um, about three boxes down from the top. And you can see that in 2018, this fund received about $5.7 million from the production tax, and that came from a 17.8 cents per taxable ton distribution from the tax. And with that, uh, that concludes my overview of the production tax. Thank you, Mr. Swanson. Any questions? Seeing none, I invite up Representative Liz Lagarde to present House File 324. And uh, do I have a motion to bring it before the committee? Yes, I'll move Madam Chair um, House File 324 for possible inclusion into a, a division report. Thank you much, uh, Representative Mark Horton. So we have the bill before us. Representative Lesker, why don't you uh, introduce us to it? Okay, thank you, Madam Chair and members. Uh, for granting me this time to present House File 324, a bill making adjustments to the Taconite Municipal Aid formula to better reflect the needs of over 35 municipalities in the Taconite Relief Area. As members of this committee, you know, Taconite taxes are paid per ton of production based on um, a very complex formula. Currently, Taconite Municipal Aid is dispersed based upon um, that formula. Unfortunately, this aid has basically been frozen in real dollars since 1983 and have not been adjusted upward to reflect inflation and the increase in taconite taxes. Thus, taconite municipal aid has been drastically reduced over time because the, of the effects of inflation. Here are some examples. The small town of Taconite received $21,341 in Taconite Municipal Aid in 1983. 36 years later, Taconite received $20,858 in this aid. The city of Aurora, where I was recently mayor, received $175,195 in Taconite Municipal Aid. Today again, 36 years later, it received $61,690. Obviously, this is not fair nor equitable for our municipalities to at least keep up with inflation and the rise in the taconite tax. In total, in 1983, $6,701,000 was distributed under the formula to, for the municipalities. House File 324 guarantees this amount distributed in 1983 will be the base amount going forward each year. Further, House File 324 adjusts annually this amount to reflect the escalator clause in the taconite tax, thus increasing taconite municipal aid by the same percentage as the taconite tax escalates. To give an example of this escalation, over the last five years, the tax has escalated on average of 1.45%, a reasonable number. In summary, House File uh, 324 does two things. It guarantees that municipalities will receive the same amount in future years as they received in 1983. And secondly, it escalates this amount by the escalation in the taconite taxes. 
This is a fairness question, um, members and colleagues. And uh, coming from small town in, in America, uh, we need all the help that we can get. And uh, what this bill does is it basically allows us to keep up with that inflation and it allows us to have a piece of the pie. And uh, when, when communities are, dollars are stretched, you know, the decisions we make today are gonna be the results we're living tomorrow. And every one of these um, um, little bit of changes helps us provide that service that is needed to our communities. So with that, I'd appreciate your support to, to bring that small amount of fairness in this distribute, uh, distribution. And with me to testify is my dear friend, Steve Georgie, the executive director of RAMS, which is the Range Association of Municipalities and Schools. And uh, also is Paul Kess, uh, a counselor from the city of Ely. So any questions, if not? Um, Representative Petersburg has a question. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair and, and Representative I think you said it, and I, it went by me a little bit fast. Um, did you say that the taconite collections for this uh, tax, uh, this particular tax raising fund uh, was going down or up over the last few years? Because that does make an impact on, on the percentage as well. So um, we- Representative List with Oh, sorry. Sorry, Madam Chair. Rookie mistake. Mm -hmm. um, Representative, um, you know, since 1980, it's going down. Uh, when I say it's going down, it hasn't increased since 1983. And the three-year rolling average, and that's where it, it goes down um, depending on, the, on, on that production tax. And what this does is it gives us that baseline of the 1983, so it would be the 6.7 million. Last year it was 5 million, you know, a little over 5 million, I believe, that he said. So this keeps it at a base, and then it also gives us that escalator that continues to go up when... Uh, the other dollars do. Representative Petersburg. Uh, uh, thank you. I'm, I'm sure, I'm not sure that I follow. So if the tax that is collected for, for the taconite is going down and this portion of the distribution wants to raise or keep level from, um, you know, 20, 30 years ago, doesn't that reduce all the distributions for all the rest of the groups that are taking money from this? No, it, it comes out of the... Representative Les Lugard. Oh, sorry. No worries. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, Representative, it comes out of those two accounts, um, the DJJ and the Environmental Protection Agency, which basically are two funds for economic development, and then also um, that the cities go to for their infrastructure. So, yes, you're right. It's coming out of them two funds, and it's going directly to the communities. So it's a direct line to the communities that, that escalate. Uh, Representative Petersburg, maybe we'll hear from a few more testifiers and see if it becomes clearer for you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Georgie, a welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself for the record. Thank you, uh, Chair Loeffler and uh, representatives. My name is Steve Georgie. I'm the executive director of the Range Association of Municipalities and Schools, better known as RAMS. Uh, RAMS is a, is a very proud historic organization that is celebrating its 80th anniversary this year. RAMS was recognized by the legislature in 1939 uh, as an advocacy group for Iron Range public uh, government units that reside within the uh, boundaries of the Taconite assistance area. So we cover uh, school districts, create those boundaries from Crosby Ironton on the west, all the way to Ely on the far east, and then over to Grand Marais down to the Two Harbors District, uh, if you want to call that uh, south. Um, but uh, all 16 public school districts are members. Uh, we have 57 public sector entities that are members of RAMS. Um, and ironically, RAMS was started by two civic organizations on the Iron Range joining forces to create one umbrella organization uh, to take on the Oliver Mining Company, who was down here in St. Paul proposing a significant change in the taxation of iron ore. That would have had a devastating impact to our iron range mining communities. So it's uh, historic that we're back here 80 years later talking about uh, now a municipal tax aid adjustment. Uh, currently there are 35 uh, communities, townships that receive funding from the municipal aid account. RAMS represents 27 of those 35 communities. The communities may, are made up of generally small uh, sector, public population sectors with, uh, uh, let me see here, 
28 of those 35 communities have a population of less than 2,000, and the vast majority of them are actually less than 1,000. So anytime we can get funding back to those communities directly uh, certainly has an impact on what the services and what level of services they can provide for those communities. Um, the community leaders and RAMS as an organization believe that it is only fair to make the adjustments to the fund the same as are done for the township fund, the DJJ, the other index funds uh, in the Taconite formula. Uh, we would apply that annual escalator clause to the base for the municipal tax aid, which would be reestablished at $6.7 million as it was in 1983. As you heard from House Research, the 2018 pay was only $5.7 million. So a loss of a million dollars over that period of time. But I can go back just from the 2013 pay to the 2018 pay years. Um, and we've lost $925,000 in that time frame paid out to these municipal communities. So by applying that escalator, hopefully we're going to see that we establish a base amount of funding for the municipalities and a minimum portion of that escalator clause, 1.45%, most recently, would be applied to that to see an increase back to the communities. Um, it's a minimal amount of money, seemingly. Um, the largest recipient is the city of Hibbing. Um, in 2014, they got $1.586 million. In 2018, they saw that reduced to $1.34. So a loss of $245,000, even to the city of Hibbing, is a significant impact to their local uh, budgets. Um, so. That's, that's uh, what we see on the smaller communities. Obviously, they get a, a smaller percentage of the payout, but it still has that significant impact on their local budgets. Um, so again, uh, we think it's appropriate that this fund, for the first time, uh, the index, the inflationary index, be applied to it going forward. We reestablish the base based on the 1983 uh, level of funding and provide some real economic uh, relief for these communities that they have full discretion to utilize as they see fit. And so I ask that the uh, committee support uh, moving House File 324 uh, to the next step. Thank you very much. And we have two other testifiers. Um, Mr. Paul Kess from uh, Ely. Welcome to the committee, and please introduce yourself for the, the tape record. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. I'm Paul Kess. I'm former uh, president of the Rams organization uh, that Steve serves as, the executive director, and I've been a city councilor in Ely for 15 or more years. Um, so without going into the, you know, the complicated formulas that are here, the idea that we bring some basic fairness to this particular fund is the goal of the bill. Uh, Ely, uh, because it, its property values have dropped over the period of time, our taconite aid from this account has gone from, I think, about 320000 all the way up to 336000 I mean, it really hard, doesn't really amount to much. But if we can lock that in as a base, maybe it might mean a reduction for us at some point going back to the 83. But having an escalator then, even in Ely, where there's... Uh, we get 300000 or a little more, it would be about a $5,000 a year increase. And it doesn't sound like anything. But to a community like Ely, with a recreation fund, with, with funds that are starving <laughs> for, for support, uh, it means real dollars to our community. So I'm asking for your support here today, uh, because the communities like Ely, uh, even though it sounds uh, insignificant almost, it's an important thing. I've been before this committee before. This bill has come in, and I think in similar fashion. Uh, a couple of years ago it came. I think it passed through the House. Uh, it got, uh, didn't, didn't make it all the way to the governor's pen, I think. Um, but in that sense, uh, when I testified before the committee before, and I mean it still, this isn't rocket science. This is bringing basic fairness. We treat the townships with an escalator. We're just asking you to treat the municipalities with that same escalator. So I appreciate your listening to me today. It's a brief presentation. Answer any questions you have. 
not about the formula though it's too complicated but <laughs> we have people to do that so if, if there's any questions we'd be glad to answer them thank you mr kess and our next witness is john agaro oops oh i'm sorry there is a question representative runback has a question thank, thank you madam chair and, and mr hess um so i just have a question about the lga i mean we have several programs impacting property taxes and and so on o over the last you know, since 1983, has LGA um, uh, tried to accommodate for the lack of growth in this other fund? Or what has happened to LGA over the course of time? Mr. Hess. Well, we certainly appreciate and uh, value the impact of LGA for our communities. Uh, life would be very difficult in smaller communities without LGA. And it has struggled to keep up. We've raised our property taxes. Uh, we've kept them in line, but it was very difficult to do. LGA is sort of a much key player. Uh, Ely must get, I'm trying to think of the number. Um, could it be close to two million? Uh, it, it forms almost half of our, our budget, or close to it, for our general fund expenditures. So LGA is critical. Tax and aid comes in and supplements that. So Representative Runback. Just to, to clarify, though, so yes, it is important. Has it, has it been compensating for the lack of the other resource? No, no. I don't think it's intended to. And uh, it has not. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank and you. now we'll welcome John Angaro. Welcome to the committee. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. I'm John Angaro, Government Relations Director for St. Louis County. Uh, I'm testifying today in strong support of House File 324, uh, especially the section that I fully understand. The escalator section, which is the easier of the two. <laughs> uh, there's an old saying that misery likes company. And uh, because uh, county government is in the exact position as city government is when it comes to the taconite production tax and the fact, as Representative Lizelgaard said, it's been almost 40 years that the cities have received any increase. In other words, their level, their dollar level has been frozen. Uh, likewise, counties in northeastern Minnesota are suffering the same consequences. And so uh, we will be having uh, a separate bill that will be coming soon to address the county portion of this issue. But I, also, I certainly wanted to uh, uh, <clears throat> be here today to lend our strong support to what Representative Lizagard is trying to accomplish here because we are going to be trying to accomplish the same thing with counties. I think that the problem going back 40 years uh, really comes down to the fact that at the time the taconite production tax really started to see some real revenue get into it. Uh, prior to that there was there wasn't a lot of money in the taconite production tax. We had the old ad valorem tax uh, off natural ore and not uh, naturally natural ore was pretty much depleted and so there wasn't much revenue coming in. So when the taconite industry started to take off in the 1970s, fortunately we had a replacement revenue source with this taconite tax. And so our legislators at the time raised the rate of the taconite production tax to help deal with things like confiscatory property tax levels that were present on the Iron Range at that time. So it's been a blessing, but I think the point that I'd like to make more than anything is you should remember that the taconite production tax is an, an in lieu of property tax. So normally the, tac, the taconite companies would be paying a property tax and a property tax, as you know, normally goes to the local taxing districts, the cities, the counties, the school districts. And I think our legislators back in the 1970s when, when this major reform took place certainly saw the balance that was necessary that yes, uh, we're not going to give as much revenue to the cities, the counties, and the school districts because we have other needs such as direct property tax relief through the Taconite Homestead Credit. We have the 2002 fund that was created because at the time they thought that Taconite was going to run out by the year 2002. So they created a separate fund to deal with when Taconite ran out. Well. Fortunately, Taconite Homestead Credit did take care of that crisis with rising property taxes, and it's still there today. 
Fortunately, the uh, calculations were wrong, predictions were wrong about the taconite running out. Matter of fact, we have likely another 100 years of taconite left. And so we've created a big economic development fund now to deal with, with that, and it's a healthy fund. So now local governments are coming forward saying, okay, uh, it's been 40 years, and uh, we think it's time that we uh, deserve a raise too. Our, our taxpayers deserve an opportunity to get some tax relief directly through the local units of government. St. Louis County, for example, estimates that if we were able to have captured just the inflation, normal inflation, because the implicit price deflator that the escalator that has been mentioned here, that St. Louis County uh, and the Taconite Homestead Credit originally in 1977 were the only two funds that received that escalator, and then we lost it shortly thereafter. <clears throat> but if that had stayed on, uh, just the inflation alone, if we had been able to capture that, we would uh, probably have property taxes across St. Louis County on the portion of St. Louis County portion of your property tax bill about 20% lower right now. But we, we don't because that money ha uh, was captured and used for other purposes throughout the Taconite relief area. Um, in 1977, there was a total of, uh, I believe, nine funds that were set up, including the cities, the counties, the school districts. Today, there are over 27 accounts that that money goes to. So all the growth that has occurred from 1977, 79 in there, when a Taconite production tax was bringing in about a buck 30 a ton, Today, as you heard, it's 275 a ton. Well, these other uh, accounts that were created and activities and uses, those are the one, those are the entities or activities, I should say, that have received that additional revenue. Where the what the basic units of government that deal with property tax revenue, our main source of revenue, we instead have been frozen out and are still stuck at $1979 levels. So uh, rather than take up any more time, again, I just want to repeat, this is a very good bill. urge you to pass it. And um, one other uh, reference, too, is that in 2015, the legislative auditor did uh, an audit uh, performance evaluation program on mineral taxation. And a lot of these discrepancies and disparities were identified in that report. And I would urge members, if you're really interested in, if you have trouble sleeping at night, in other words, insomnia, insomnia, you get a copy of that report, you start reading it, you're gonna fall asleep in no time. So with that, I stand for any questions. Thank you, Mr. Hurt. And Representative Hurtas has a um, question. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you for telling your story about uh, the taconite taxes. Could you, uh, or do you have any information as to making this committee understand a little bit more the percentage of your total tax capacity that um, the mining industry actually represents? I mean, obviously you still have other CI property and homestead property that property taxes are still being collected from, um, but could you uh, comment on that? Mr. Ngaro. Well, Madam Chair and Representative Hurtis, that's a, it's a difficult question to answer because uh, the mining in industry is, is so different than, and that's one of the reasons why the production tax uh, is in place. I mean, if you go back to 1964, for example, remember the Taconite Amendment that passed. The Taconite Amendment uh, didn't even apply at all to the Taconite production tax. The Taconite Amendment applied to the occupation tax, froze that for 25 years. It applied to the, uh, <clears throat> the uh, royalty tax, uh, too, and froze that for 25 years. So, uh, and back before that, when the old ad valorem tax was in place, the way that tacon or mining companies, I don't want to call it taconic companies, I think reserve was the only one around back then, uh, the old natural ore mines, uh, they paid a very complicated ad valorem tax 
And I mean, it would take me, and I would have to do some old research again, but um, it is, was a very complicated, very controversial way in which they taxed the mining companies because they essentially taxed the unmined ore that was there. And that was a way to bring in a lot of revenue to those communities that had uh, a, a mine, a, a large open pit mine near, within their municipal jurisdictions. So, I mean, uh, you know, I, I remember reading that in the early 1950s, for example, the amount of tax revenue that came in to the state of Minnesota and the local governments combined is probably about five times what is coming in today to give you an idea that the old ad valorem tax and occupation taxes, et cetera, did tax mining companies at a much higher rate than we do today. But then again, that was a totally different type of mining. That was open pit mining. The ore was easier to get to and everything. And taconite is a much more um, uh, sophisticated and uh, expensive way to mine ore. So it's comparing apples and oranges to a little bit. So, I, so I'd hate to really uh, wager a guess. Representative Hurtas. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Well, I think the core of my question, I was trying to understand the uh, relationship of the percent of revenue that your local governments, local jurisdictions derive of their total budget from mining versus other sources of uh, taxes or property taxes. Uh, Mr. Angaro. Uh, Madam Chair and, and Representative uh, Hurtas, I can tell you that in 1979, St. Louis County uh, derived 18% of our revenue uh, from taconite production tax. Okay. Today, uh, we derive approximately 6%. Okay. And yes, our goal would be to get closer to the 18%. We think that was what the founding legislators that established that real uh, comprehensive production tax, uh, IRRRB, Taconite relief area, none of that really existed prior to 1977. It did in a very small way because the production tax itself <coughs> brought in so little revenue. It was only once several taconite companies were up and running and everything, and again, because property taxes were so high on the range that the legislators decided we have to start taxing this industry and getting more revenue to help bring down property taxes. So that's that's the, the quick history. Okay. And Thank you. Tech, taconite taxes are complicated. I'll just remind um, members that we have another bill with seven testifiers, many who came from out of state, and I have three other people who have questions. Yep. Representative Hurtas. Thank you. And, and that statistic you gave me wouldn't necessarily surprise me because while the size of the mines and the mining companies themselves probably were somewhat static, over this period of time, I would presume that the other tax base has grown. In my lifetime, over the last 40 years, I've seen the the, the place that uh, we much love and enjoy in northeastern Minnesota grow and develop and is, is much better. So I would think that uh, naturally, as the other base, tax capacity base grows, the percentage of the total base would go down from the 18% to 6% or something of that nature. So um, on one hand, I, I hear your message. On the other hand, uh, congratulations to the Northeast. I think that you certainly are growing and, and uh, have diversified your economy. Okay, I think that was a statement. Thank you. Um, Representative Petersburg. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and um, I think your testimony and the testimony here really does uh, indicate that municipalities are getting less from this particular production tax. Uh, and, and I'm not sure, Madam Chair, how you're going to put this into your bill, uh, but it's certainly... Um, I'm sure you'll, you'll get it in there somewhere. But my point is more of a comment, and that is that if you look at the mining tax guide that was presented, uh, this one here, um, and if you look at 2017 versus 2018, you see at the bottom that there was actually 85% collected in 2017 versus 2013. And with if that trend continues, that the tax is actually collected less each year, as we do more and more of the accounts in which we keep it static or inflated, uh, inflated uh, with an inflator, and then add on top of that those that are set with so many cents per ton, 
the remaining ones on that list are going to get exponentially less and less because you can only distribute the funds a certain number of ways. And so my caution is just that, you know, that kind of sets up more and more lo losers in regards to um, uh, those that are getting these funds, and we're going to come back with a lot of people wanting more. So it, it is a complicated matter, and it's just food for thought. Thank you. I appreciate your thoughts. Uh, Representative Draskowski. Thank you, Madam Chair. A question, I guess, would be for Mr. Ungaro and maybe the author as well. Um, so um, cities are going to be getting more money from this bill. Um, so how much uh, can we expect to their need for um, LGA to reduce? Madam Chair and Madam Chair and uh, Representative, I hope none. Um, LGA. So uh, when I was the mayor, our annual budget was about three million dollars. You just heard there that we got about 161,000 in the Taconite Municipal Aid, and then um, our uh, local government aid was about 600,000. So you add that two together, it's about 900,000 one third. And what you need to understand about Greater Minnesota and some of the a lot of these small communities, we have nothing to tax. These people are on fixed incomes. Their home values are not there, right? So you, 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 you know, when you're, you can raise all the taxes you want, but if the value of the home is not there, you, we're, all we're trying to do is provide um, necessary services, right? You know, that's the goal of this. So local government aid, no offense, Tim Pawlenty, uh, when he went after it, he, he, he just totally destroyed up there. And we raise taxes on all these people that are on fixed incomes, and we're still digging ourselves out. So to that point, I hope that uh, we get our LGA. That's how important it is. So, Madam Thank Chair. you. Representative Draskowski. Thank you. Well, uh, Representative Lissigard, uh, I'm, I live in greater Minnesota, too, so I understand it very well. And uh, my largest town is 4,000 people. So you understand what we're talking about? Well, I also understand spending and, and the propensity for governments to spend and spend and spend. And so re regardless of whether they're small governments or large governments, and so my question was, uh, are your towns going to want to continue to spend the additional money and continue to ask for even more LGA and spend more? Or um, are they going to, uh, uh, with this additional money, and I, I like your bill, uh, because uh, there are some other areas here uh, within the taconite uh, distribution formula that I really question. And I think this is probably better use for it. But um, I'm wondering about the uh, propensity for maybe the government that you uh, were mayor in uh, to actually uh, put some fiscal restraint on or whether it's just kind of no, ho no holds barred and uh, spend it all. Uh, the Democrats like to do that here, so you might be in the right place. Well, Representative Lislegard, I'll let you respond, but also I'll remind Representative Kowski, this is mainly about an escalator that has averaged 1.45%. Um, so, thank you. Representative uh, Lislegard. Uh, Madam Chair and Representative, you know, uh, our communities uh, might be up north, but uh, we're trying to do the right thing the right way, and we can read and write and add, too. So, um, in all honesty, uh, I think that they're doing a pretty good job for the amount of resources that they had, and every little bit helps. Thank you. Thank you. Representative McDonald has the final question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Question for House Research, only because I'm going to spend some time with my wife up in Grand Marais this weekend, and it's a lovely area, so uh, as I visit with the residents, I want to know what I'm talking about uh, to share. I'm just curious as to why, what was the history of to why the property tax were exempted on those beautiful mines? You know, obviously, it's a large acreage and uh, and there's some very important uh, monies that could be uh, that needed up there in the school districts and the cities and the county so I'm just wondering what the history was of exempting them and was it always exempted or was it exempted in lieu of the production tax and that is uh, Mr. all I have to Mr. Ask. Swanson you want to take a, a very brief history <laughs> yeah yes madam chair and, and representative McDonald I believe the reason for exempting uh, these mines from Property taxes has to do with the difficulty in assessing the value of these of these properties. So, um, you know, because a, a lot of the value, you know, in the taconite mines has to do with um, you know, maybe market prices for um, the minerals that are there and, and other factors that can just be difficult to assess these properties. And, and this was seen as a a, a way to um, still levy levy a tax on these properties without having to uh, worry about the assessment issues. Mm -hmm. Follow up, Madam Chair. Yep. 
Representative McDonald. Thank you for that description. Is that uh, then the production tax? Is that because it's capped then at uh, the um, what's the 10 million tons? Is that what the is that why there is a cap on that? Mr. Swanson. Uh, Madam Chair and Representative McDonald, I'm not sure which uh, which cap you're referring to. Well, I'll have to look at the. Representative McDonald. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. The, the production uh, the production tax is a uh, tax. Let's see, I'll have to find it here. But isn't it capped at a certain amount over 10 million tons? Swanson. Uh, Madam Chair, Representative McDonald, there's um, there isn't a cap on. Um, on the amount of production that's taxed, um, but if you, um, if if you find a different question, I'd be happy to follow up with you yeah. again later. Thank you, thank you very much, Madam Chair. I'll uh, one go of off the advantages of, of having really smart staff is we can always follow up later when, when we've had a chance to ponder a little bit more um, what's before us. With that, um, Representative Marquardt renews his motion that the House file. Uh, <laughs> 324 be laid over for possible inclusion. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed nay. Motion is approved. Thank you very much. Thank Thanks you. to the witnesses as well. And um, our second half of the agenda is on something that's an emerging issue that's not quite yet in front of us. Um, and we're not sure if it will be in front of us um, before the end of this term. It uh, has to do with state assessed uh, property that's currently right now before the courts. We don't know if there will be a ruling before the end of session. We don't know the timing of that ruling. It may be followed by further need to go back to the tax court for discussions. So we're bringing this in front of the committee, not because we have a particular solution, although we're gonna hear one, um, but because we really think the committee needs to be aware of this, that it's on the horizon, and it may suddenly emerge um, as something we have to wrestle with. And uh, with that, I'd like to, again, uh, welcome our House Research staff, Jared Swanson and Alex Hagler, to give us some background on state-assessed property. Welcome back. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Um, so Ms. Hagler and I are, are just going to try to maybe set the context for the, the next bill. And uh, Ms. Hagler is going to spend some time talking about a specific court case. But before we get to that point, I want to talk about some of the uh, important aspects of, of not only that court case, but of the, the bill that we will uh, be hearing shortly as well. Uh, so I'm going to be just talking through this, this short handout. It says state assessed property at the top. Um, and it's uh, just a two-sided uh, document that deals with um, property assessed by the Department of Revenue. So for property tax purposes, generally uh, property is assessed at the local level, uh, typically by, by a county. Uh, but law requires that the Department of Revenue assess four types of property. Uh, so this includes airline flight property, and then railroad pipeline and utility operating property. Uh, where operating property just means the, uh, the properties that are directly related to the operations of the organization. Uh, but if a, a railroad company, for example, owns some vacant land or maybe they had some rent land that they rented out to a, another organization, uh, that could be considered non-operating property and that would be assessed at the local level instead of by the state. So the uh, assessment of pipeline and utility operating property is guided by Rule 8100. And this rule just outlines really three parts of the assessment process for uh, valuing these types of properties. And, and those three pieces are what I'm gonna talk about on this handout. And they are valuation, uh, which involves just estimating the value of the entire utility or pipeline system. Allocation, which involves taking that unit value <coughs> and allocating a portion of that to the state of Minnesota. And then finally, apportionment, where apportionment is just taking that Minnesota value and then spreading it out to the uh, local jurisdictions where these properties are located. So valuation, um, which again is just setting that unit value for the entire utility or, or pipeline system, um, has uh, three different approaches to determining this value. Uh, the cost approach, the income approach, and then the market or sales approach. Uh, the cost approach uh, just determines value um, based on what it would cost to replace the property. So under the cost approach, the value is just equal to 
the cost of the property minus any depreciation within the system. The income approach uh, establishes value by determining um, or determines the value by capitalizing the net operating earnings for the company over the previous three years. And the idea behind this is that uh, the value is based on the ability of the property to generate income. So under this approach, uh, the income, net operating income for the, the company in the previous three years gets weighted with more weight given to the most recent years. And then that value, or sorry, that uh, those earnings are turned into a value by dividing the earnings by a capitalization rate. And a capitalization rate is just a, it's a rate of return that the property is expected to produce. So um, income can be used to determine the value of the property. And then finally, the market or sales approach just uses comparable sales to determine the value. Um, but as you might imagine, there are, are few, if any, sales of uh, pipeline or utility systems. So this approach may or may not be appropriate uh, depending on the circumstances. And, and given that, the uh, Department of Revenue actually has some discretion as to how to await these different approaches. Uh, for example, if they are uh, assessing a system and they don't feel like there are really any comparable sales for this system, um, they don't necessarily have to use that and they can give more weight to the other approaches. Uh, there's an example on the, the back side of this handout um, at the top of the page where a unit value is established using all three approaches. So in this example, um, you can see that the, the market or the sales approach was at least given some weight, but not nearly as much as the other two approaches. So here the, the cost and income approaches uh, combined for about 90% of the valuation, and the market approach is just weighted at 5%. So um, this would be a situation where uh, the state felt that the, the information or the data that they have um, maybe was better for the cost and income methods and thus more weight is given to those approaches. And this is just a hypothetical example here, but uh, you can see that the value after being weighted, um, the, each of these approaches are added together and the, the unit value is just determined from the sum of, of all of the approaches that are used. So once this unit value has been established, uh, an amount of this entire system value needs to be allocated to the state of Minnesota. And that's the next step in this process known as allocation. The process of allocation can differ depending on if it's a utility property versus a pipeline property. Uh, the example on your handout takes a look at how allocation occurs for pipeline properties. And in this example, there are really just two different um, two different calculations that are made. One is the percent of the total plant cost that can be allocated to property in Minnesota. And the other is the percent of the system's throughput that passes through the state. So each of these calculations are then, it's, it's basically two percentages that are calculated and each one is weighted. Uh, you can see that more weight is given to the plant cost. That's rated, weighted at 75%. And less weight is given to the throughput calculation. Uh, but once these two percentages are weighted, uh, you end up with a percent that can be used for allocation. So this percent would be multiplied by the unit value um, that was determined in the previous step. So if we just take the, the two examples that are on this back page, um, under this example, the, the total unit or the total system value for the property would be $4.9 million. And then about 33.76% of that would be allocated to Minnesota. So you would just multiply those two numbers together to get the value of this company's property within the state. Once the value, the Minnesota portion of the value has been determined, uh, that amount gets apportioned down to the local units of government. So the value is just split between the jurisdictions based on the cost of the property within each taxing area. And then that value is what gets used in the local property tax calculations. And that concludes my overview of uh, state assessed property in Rule 8100. Uh, Ms. Hagler is going to uh, walk through a court case next. Great. Welcome, Ms. Hagler. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. For the record, my name is Alex Hagler from House Research. And I'm just going to give, in the interest of time, um, a brief overview of the Enbridge case. Um, you all have a handout in your packets that's um, titled State Assessed Property Tax Appeals. Um, it's two, pa well, two physical pages, but um, about three pages. Um, so first, I'm just going to start with a tiny overview of how appeals work, and then I'll move into the procedural history and 
how the tax court ruled and then what the issue is on appeal up at the Supreme Court and then I'll conclude um, by talking about some potential outcomes of the case. Um, Thank you and, and just for the benefit of the public as well as people who are um, on the committee, this is dealing with the valuation of the existing Enbridge pipelines. This has is not related at all to the proposal to change the route and establish new pipelines. Just so you know, there's two separate issues in front of the public domain at this point, and this is about how do we assess and value those pipelines that currently exist. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair, for that clarification. Um, so under current law, um, pipeline and utility companies can appeal their valuation in one of two ways, or both ways, actually. Um, they can file an administrative appeal with the Department of Revenue, or they can just file an appeal directly in tax court, and at any time the parties are able to settle. Um, so the Enbridge case is, um, as Madam Chair said, the um, Enbridge pipeline that goes through um, parts of Canada and across the United States and through um, some counties in Minnesota, and those counties are listed here. Um, the assessments under appeal are from the years 2012 all the way through the years 2018. However, some of these years are traveling separate tracks. Um, so for tax years 2012, 2013, and 2014, um, I give a little bit of an overview of how the timeline here worked and why this essentially is taking so long is essentially because litigation is a very long process. Um, there can be pretrial motions, stays, and anything like that that can take um, a few years to actually get the um, <coughs> trial underway. So the trial was held, and in May 2018, the tax court um, issued its ruling and um, set values for those um, three years, 2012, 2013, and 2014. Then um, in later that year in July, the um, there was an appeal to the Supreme Court um, by the Commissioner of Revenue, and then in November, the, there was oral, oral arguments held at the Supreme Court level. There isn't a deadline for the Supreme Court to issue their decision, um, so that is still pending right now, and we're not really sure when they're going to make their decision. Um, so then for the other tax years, 2015 and 2016, and I also believe 2017 was rolled into there as well, um, there was a trial in the tax court this past December and rolled into January. And um, after the parties are able to do some post-trial briefing with the court, um, which may take that into April or um, March, then the tax court, after the final post-trial brief is submitted, has three months to issue their decision. So that might come sometime summer or spring. And that is just for 15, 16, and 17. Um, so moving down on the second page is a box that um, gives a comparison of the commissioner's assessment versus the tax court's determination of value for the 2012 through 2014 years. The, the court doesn't do the allocation or apportionment portion. They just do the valuation of the pipeline as a whole. And um, what the tax court said in their ruling is that the rule that um, Mr. Swanson was talking about rule 8100 is for the commissioner to do their valuation and is the tax court is not bound to use that same rule. So what they did was they did not use the cost approach for this valuation because they determined that the evidence submitted wasn't sufficient to make a valuation on that and they only used the income approach. Um, so um, this handout also it goes into a little bit more detail on why the court um, ruled that way in not using 8100. And if you do have specific questions on that, please um, ask me. Um, but on appeal, the commissioner asserted that the tax court is in fact ruled by 8100 and um, they should have used it in their determination. Um, but Enbridge, on the other hand, said that it's not and there is a discretionary paragraph in the rule that allows the commissioner or the tax court to deviate from the rule if the circumstances allow it. And that is the issue on appeal. They're not appealing the actual numbers. They're just appealing whether or not the tax court should have used the rule. Um, so in the potential outcomes here, the Supreme Court will um, make a finding as to whether or not the tax court erred by not using the rule. 
Um, if it finds that the court did err, the case will be remanded back to the tax court and the tax court will do the valuation again based on Rule 8100 where they may or may not use the cost or income approach. And as Mr. Swanson said, sometimes the sales approach is um, not often used. Um, if the Supreme Court finds that the court did not err, um, the parties will still need to come to a determination of the alloc allocation, right? yeah. the allocation of the part of the entire valuation that is f um, just for Minnesota. And that was in the tax court um, findings of facts and conclusions of law. And it said that the parties had to make that determination. And then if they couldn't, then the tax court would step in and do it for them. Um, so the parties will need to conference to make that determination. And once the parties or the court do the determination, um, then they'll be able to set the amount of refunds owed. And that's only for 2012 through 2014. They're still waiting on the 2015 to through 2017 um, decisions, but regardless, this case, the Supreme Court is not the last stop. And that is all I have. Thank you, Ms. Hagler, for going through a long legal history <laughs> in a way that um, some of us, at least who aren't lawyers, could totally follow along. Mm -hmm. um, but as you can see, members, this is a, a major impact court case, and it could land in our lap at some unknown point in the spring, or it may happen this summer after we're in interim break. Um, but it does have a real implications for the local governments that are affected, and which is why I'd like to uh, invite up Representative Sundin to present his bill, his proposal, um, for one way to deal with this proposal. And we're going to take the questions on it afterwards, just because we've had people who've traveled from greater Minnesota to testify, and we'll have other times to discuss this. But um, I want to make sure that we get to the testimony. So I appreciate the patience of the committee on that. Um, and as I said earlier, this is just Representative Sundin is presenting one idea for how we might respond. Um, and uh, there's going to be a whole range. We have no idea what the result will be. Um, so we'll react to the court ruling when, when it actually comes. But with that, uh, welcome to the committee, Representative Sundin. And uh, we'll have a motion from member to um, bring the House File 424 before us for, to be laid over for possible inclusion. Uh, would someone like to make that motion? So move, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Markhart. The House File 424 is in front of us. Welcome to the committee, Representative Sunding. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Uh, I'll be brief. I think you've, uh, everybody here realizes uh, what the problem is uh, as, as far as uh, uh, the inequities uh, that are going to be afforded to the counties and municipalities uh, uh, that affect that would be affected by these uh, decisions that uh, that are pending you know and I think it's uh, pointed out quite well there's multiple issues here that are gonna affect uh, uh, the ultimate determination of this uh, these court cases so uh, I'm not gonna burden you with uh, any arguments as to why we should do this you know it's just the right thing to do uh, for these uh, uh, other uh, political subdivisions they're uh, encumbered with the decision of the state of Minnesota on how this these properties are assessed and uh, they have no way out so we're seeking recourse uh, from the state of Minnesota to backfill the uh, uh, the loss of revenue for uh, counties school districts municipalities uh, right on down the line uh, and I've got uh, uh, I think about four test testifiers uh, ready to uh, back up uh, the, the need for uh, uh, some type of uh, equitable solution for these municipalities and, and uh, counties. So uh, I'd like to point out, firstly, uh, County Commissioner Mark Thell, who actually lives from, uh, comes from Renshaw, Minnesota, where there was a uh, referendum recently for a building trades campus in within that school district in uh, Renshaw, Minnesota. And it came close, but it failed. And it failed because of the uncertainty of uh, uh, tax revenue uh, for that school district and the surrounding area. So if uh, County Commissioner Mark Dell would like to weigh in on uh, the effects to the county and uh, his school district. Welcome to the committee, Mr. Thell, and please introduce yourself for the record. 
Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Mark Zell, I'm commissioner for the 4th District of Carleton County, um, two of the townships, uh, Twin Lakes and Silverbrook, are kind of like the corridor for these utility lines. And I'd like to start by going back to when it started, 1950. America was just coming back to being a, not a war nation, but in great need of petroleum products to, to fund the, the change from going from the little two-cylinder and four-cylinder tractors that used a little bit of fuel and so these quarters were opened up in 1950, and my parents' farm was the initial stage when oil lines started crossing Minnesota to deliver oil from the Dakotas and Canada <clears throat> to the refineries in our area. And that first acquisition was, it's always interesting, that was $50 to cross a 40. It was what they paid for that initial right away. And today, in, in 2011, there now there is 11 lines that cross those 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 properties that now my children own, and <clears throat> for that they have given up a lot for those corridors to be there. We 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 can farm them. There are no more trees left across those corridors. There is no more homes. So the property valuations, their farmland, they're not something that's developable farmland into building projects which. Typically, and when you assess properties, those become higher value to the community. And there's, when this new line comes through, there'll be displacements of homes that have to go out of the way for that line. So the compacting factor are two very important things that I hope this legislation will take care of, <clears throat> is some of this offset we have to go back. If we have to go back and pick that up, or those might mention the Renshaw and the Carleton School District, they're struggling with aging buildings. They have to get voter approved authority. And when you don't know, you can project on a bonding bill, you might raise your taxes 150, but when you're sitting there and you have this angst, we don't know if this is gonna cost them $300, $400, $500 additional per year because of this offset. That's where the complicating factor is. It's, like I said, it, it, the last line was built through there in 2011, and there's 11 lines across this corridor. There's some corridors there that are 16 lines. It's like now we come and we sit here and we don't know. <clears throat> From the county end, we have a, a jail system that needs to be upgraded, and that's gonna take a, a, a big chunk of money to bond and build for that, and other methods that we have. And if we have to figure out how we're gonna come up with the, the bypass revenue that we have to pay for, that just puts all of these things on hold. And these aging infrastructures in between the two school districts and the county are is, is in jeopardy of being done, which sooner or later the state is gonna require the county to build a new jail. It's just one of those things that has to be done so picking up with this bill to offset some of the back cost in adapting the formulas moving forward is what I'm hoping this can be critical for the needs of the residents and so the communities can still prosper without being unnecessary burdened by a decision of changing the valuation scheme, which Kai will talk in depth as our assessor on how that's gonna affect us, so thank you. Thank you, Commissioner uh, Fell. And uh, welcome to the committee, Carla Holmes from Carleton County as well. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Kyle Holmes. I am currently the County Assessor for Carleton County in Northeastern Minnesota. In addition to representing Carleton County here today, I am also the former past president of the Minnesota Association of Assessing Officers, and I am currently the sitting finance officer of the MAO also. Uh, I've been authorized by this association to speak on their behalf in, this regard, in regards to this legislation as well today. On behalf of Carleton County and MAO, I wanna thank you for allowing me the opportunity to comment on House File 424. I'm here to testify in full support of this bill as proposed. As I'm sure you are aware, the state of Minnesota, and in particular the Commissioner of Revenue, are responsible for setting the market values for property tax purposes on all state assessed properties. These properties are the power companies, trans transmission distribution lines, gas companies, pipeline companies, railroad, and the like. These companies are many times the largest valued properties within any given jurisdiction. Therefore, they are oftentimes the largest taxpayers. 
Many of these companies have begun challenging these values in the Minnesota tax court against the Commissioner of Revenue as far back as 11 years ago. In Carleton County, for example, we have nine of these utility slash railroad companies that have filed in tax court. Three of the nine have already been decided and refunds have already been issued for Carleton County in the amount of $348,000 in 2017, including interest. One other case, Enbridge, which, Enbridge Energy, which we have talked about here today, has been ruled on, uh, but is still being appealed through the system. Five more have yet to either be heard or in the process of the tax court issuing a decision. In extremely tight fiscal environments that we face nowadays, the paybacks we have made thus far have stung, but the ones that we could potentially be facing here in the near future are sure to be disastrous, and we look to you as leaders for solutions. In Carleton County, four of the five top, top taxpayers in our county are public utilities. Eight of our top 10 taxpayers in the county are public utilities. These eight utilities make up approximately 20% of our local tax base. Out of the top four utilities, three are currently awaiting decisions in the court. And although it's not just Enbridge Energy, Enbridge is by far our number one taxpayer in our county. As a matter of fact, Enbridge Energy and Enbridge Energy LP are our number one and number five largest taxpayers in our county. So they are by far and away the number one taxpayer in our county. Although there are cases, although the Enbridge case has not been finalized and completed through the appeal, completed through the appeal process, we do have an initial decision from the tax court that is at the Supreme Court level. That has allowed us to begin planning, and if that decision is upheld, it will be absolutely devastating to our county, and in particular, a handful of our townships and school districts within which the actual utility resides. We at the county level have been working with these townships and school districts on a way to meet our obligations in the event these rulings do hold up. Remember, we at the local level do not get extra revenue by these companies. We do not get rich off these companies. They simply add to our tax base like any other good paying taxpayer does helping to keep the overall tax rates down on every other taxpayer, including themselves within the district. Carleton County, our local jurisdictions and school districts are looking at paybacks in the potential millions of dollars. Needless to say, we, have, we do not have a good solution. We've been exploring the possibility working with our townships that some of them are quite possibly gonna go bankrupt and what that means to them and the taxpayers. These potential paybacks are crippling us at the local level from being able to conduct business, as you heard Commissioner Thell speak to, and in, the, and in the best interest of our taxpayers like we need to. Like everyone else, we have other issues that need our immediate attention, but due to these potential obligations, everything from our bond rating, yes, Moody's is reviewing our bond rating because of these cases, to our reserves are beholden to these cases and their resolutions. Two of our townships in particular could be facing paybacks that are five to eight times their annual levies as they sit currently. That is just on the Enbridge case that's before you. We also have eight other companies that are in tax court also, and some of them are just like Enbridge, some of our largest taxpayers in our county. These township officials are looking to us within county leadership for answers, of which right now we have none. At the county level, we are just as worried. Not only can these potential paybacks, not only of the potential paybacks these cases have and will continue to cause, but almost as importantly as the tax shift that these reductions in value are going to be having on all other taxpayers in the county should these rulings hold up. Again, we do not have any good answers to give, but this bill at least allows us a breathing place and, is, and gives us a chance to try to figure out how to move forward to help work to minimize the tax shifts we are sure to face in the future. It will give us the ability to provide some answers to our townships, cities, and school districts and hopefully give them a little peace of mind they need and the assurances they have and the assurances that they will continue to exist and survive these appeals. Madam Chair and members of the committee, I thank you once again for allowing me to speak in support of House File 424 and I would like to restate that the Minnesota Association of Assessing Officers and Carleton County are in full support of this bill as presented. If any members have any questions, I would stand for them now. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Holmes. And uh, we have five more testifiers in the next short amount of time. So to the degree that you can shorten your testimony to two or three minutes, that would be great. But I really appreciate Mr. Holmes um, kind of illustrating how much the impact could be on some of the communities that are affected by this. Thank you. And next we have um, Al Paulson from Clearwater, Clearwater County. Welcome. And thanks for coming to St. Paul to share your thoughts. Thank you very much. Um, Chairman Loeffler and members of the committee, thank you for allowing me to present my concerns at your committee hearing today. 
My name is Al Paulson. I've been elected as a Clearwater County Auditor Treasurer and I'm serving my 14th year. Clearwater County is a small northern county of, with 8,000 plus residents. Our tax base is agricultural, seasonal, residential properties and utilities. With um, tank farms, pumping station, utilities, pipeline, uh, uh, railroad and utility um, uh, transfer, uh, transport lines, uh, utilities pay about 50% of our Clearwater County total taxes. Our current county levy is $7.7 .7 million. This levy is less than Enbridge tax valuation appeal, which could hit Clearwater County with a worst case of $9.2 million. That's $9.2 million with a levy of $7.7 .7 million. Clearwater County has always levied for the needs of the county with careful consideration of the values provided at our Board of Equalization. These values are scrutinized in our budgeting process with every department and a notification of truth and taxation notice provided to our taxpayers. <coughs> These tax dollars are collected over the years have been levied, billed, and collected for, and then they've been settled out to the townships, cities, school districts, state of Minnesota, and Clarita County. Clarita County does not have reserves to cover any settlement to utility companies. Our county commissioners levy for the services that are needed and nothing more. If Enbridge is successful in their valuation appeal, we have no clue on how to pay back these dollars. Even in this uncertain time, the Department of Revenue has certified to us again of a $38 million increase in Enbridge valuation for taxes payable 2019. Counties should not be penalized for values that have been certified to them by the Department of Revenue. We have no say in these valuations and we accept these values as correct. So you can understand that through no fault of our own, we find ourselves on the sideline looking on the Enbridge tax court case challenge of several years of elevated valuations resulting from a 2012 Minnesota Department of Revenue formula change. We're hopeful the state of Minnesota stands ready to help counties should the courts decide against the Department of Revenue. But in the meantime, the state of Minnesota needs to do something to bring greater certainty that counties like Clearwater will not be left with very limited options. Thank you for your time today. Thank you so much, Commissioner, our auditor, for coming down and um, sharing that. And um, I think that points out the seriousness of this um, in terms of the potential local impact. Thank you all for the, what you do for us as well. And thank you, um, Matt Hilgert from the Association of Minnesota Counties is next. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Uh, as an introduction, my name is Matt Hilgart and I represent the Association of Minnesota Counties. Today, I will also speak, be speaking on behalf of the Minnesota Inter-County Association and the Minnesota Rural Counties Coalition as well. Um, I wanna thank the author and uh, also members of this committee because uh, as I'm sure uh, a lot of you are aware, this isn't the first time the issue has been brought forth. It's been dealt with and heard bills on and several times uh, all the way back, dating back to 2015. So I appreciate that. And as you can tell by the t testimony, there's a lot of fear from our members about what these cases hold and the implications they hold for their communities and their viability moving forward. I have to say also from AM AMC's perspective, this is probably one of the most popular topics at all of our conferences for the last three years. Everyone is always asking the department or for updates from the utility companies on what's happening, where they are in the process, because of the fact that we don't really have a role in this process. Uh, one of the most important things to keep in mind, I think, <coughs> is that local governments didn't write these rules, the rules that council talked about, Rule 8100. Um, local governments didn't assess these properties, and local governments didn't have any role in mediating the values or defending the values in court. So really our role in all this process is just a witness and then ultimately um, the recipient of a potential refund order. The second thing to keep in mind is the in inability to pay back. As members may know, about one third of the refund orders would probably be paid um, by the state and that's just a rough calculation. Um, that comes from the state general fund. Uh, conversely, if counties, cities, school districts, townships get hit with a refund order, their choice is very limited. It comes from the re reserves. And while the state auditor publishes guidelines that I believe say that uh, local government should have up to six months of budget balance on their reserve books, in many of those cases that would deplete most if not more than the reserves that counties have on hand. Um, and really what is the only option at that point is to levy and raise taxes more. And I don't say this lightly, but with 
the tax court cases 13, 14, 15, which are being disputed um, right now at the Supreme Court level, in addition to the other years that will be forthcoming, um, raising tax rates at a certain level to pay back what we think may, we may have to pay back may not make communities viable in some of these northern areas of the state. And that's what you're hearing from concerns about these local government leaders. Lastly, I want to just uh, remind legislators that this is a statewide issue. Even though today's um, testimony really centers on this Enbridge case because of the magnitude, because of the fact that the tax court said the department oversessed uh, a company by more than $2 billion, um, really this rule impacts all utility properties. So whether it's Merck and hits some of the suburban or metro communities um, that members represent <laughs> here, or Alliance that hits some of the southwestern Ag Belt communities, um, this has, this Enbridge case could have the precedent to impact everyone's districts here at this table. So I want to close by just saying thank you. Thank you for listening. Thank you to, for listening to these local government leaders and uh, Chair Loeffler for giving us the time today to talk about these impacts. And from AM, AMC's perspective, we are um, sincerely interested not only in this bill, but long-term solutions to try to address the instability and consistency factors in these assessments. So thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Hilgart, for coming and speaking on behalf of the counties. Uh, next, we have Joanne Wright from Northern Nashville Gas. Welcome, and please introduce yourself for the table. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is Joanne Wright. I'm the property tax manager for Northern Natural Gas Company. Northern's an interstate natural gas pipeline company with 14,700 miles of pipeline and transmission facilities in 12 states. That includes 3,300 miles of pipeline and 13 compressor stations here in Minnesota. We employ 110 people in this state, in 2018, Northern paid $16.6 .6 million in property taxes to 60 Minnesota counties. We expect in 2019 that number to be 18 million. Northern brought suit against the Department of Revenue, alleging that our system had been overvalued for years 2015 through 2018. We brought this suit because compared to other states that utilize a very similar methodology to the one here in Minnesota, Minnesota's value is 25 to 35 percent higher than our other states. In August of 18, we tried our 2015 and 2016 case. But before I get to that, I do want to state that Northern does not routinely file these challenges to our assessed valuation, not in Minnesota or any other state. I have been in my position for 16 years. This is the first and only valuation Northern has brought. But we were so compelled to do so because the state's methodology was so unfair, we felt we had to file this case. The trial was held in August of 18, and just 12 days ago, the tax court issued their decision in Northern's case. This was issued on January 30th, 2019, and the state tax court did conclude that in fact our value was overvalued. And I want you to remember that 25 and 35 percent percent that I gave you earlier because the, tor the tax court concluded that we were overvalued by 24 percent in 2015 and 33 percent in 2016. The tax court criticized the Department of Revenue on two main issues. The first being they failed to recognize economic obsolescence from external factors. We presented evidence on factors such as spending that we have to do from our regulatory commission and items that are not in our earning base like deferred income taxes. Second, the DOR used a capitalization rate that was considerably too low. And as you heard, a low cap rate results in a value that's far too high. We estimate our refunds due to this opinion for the four years under protest to be about $17 million. Our top 10 counties that are affected by this overvaluation are Dakota, Rice, Freeborn, Carleton, Steele, Hennepin, Washington, St. Louis, Chisago, and Carver. The refunds due Northern as a result of this decision could 
negatively affect and bring hardship on these affected counties and their residents. So on behalf of Northern, I'm submitting this testimony today to voice our support for House File 424, requiring the Department of Revenue to pay the refunds to the centrally assessed taxpayers. This so-called state pays legislation is just one way, and the legislature has various ways to address this problem, and this is certainly one of them. And we understand that this bill also mitigates the impact to the counties because often we can be one of the top, if not the top taxpayer in the county. And I do want to state that our company and other companies, we have no objection to paying our fair share of taxes. When we're valued equitably, we have no problem paying our taxes. We're a partner in these counties. We have employees that live there and educate their children there. It's just when the valuation is so out of line with what we expect and has been struck down by the court more than once that we feel we had to move forward. Now we anticipate that the Department of Revenue is going to tell you this, this new appeal process that they implemented last year cures all of this controversy. But this assertion is inaccurate and should be looked upon with extreme skepticism. We tried the new administrative process in 2018 to no avail. In fact, in the appeal of Northern, which was held last summer under the new procedures, the Department of Revenue offered Northern a 3% reduction. And this was on a value that was higher than the 15 and 16 value that was struck down by the court two weeks ago. Our value was 38% higher than our typical other states. And so the, in your packet, I believe you have this study that was done by the Minnesota Center for Fiscal Excellence, and it is full of very good information. They also confirm that the new appeal process does nothing to stem the tide of the, quote, explosion of appeals. Ms. Wright, I'm going to have to ask you to wrap up just because we have two more testifiers and just six minutes left. Okay. I would urge you to look at page 19 to see how the number of appeals have grown. I did poll some of the other major centrally assessed companies here in Minnesota, and they all confirm they have issues only in Minnesota. Enbridge, which has been a lot of this discussion here, is in 39 states. They have litigation in one, Minnesota. Uh, the same is true for Merck, who's only filed in one state out of the four they're in. Newstar has property in 15 states. They only have Minnesota litigation pending. I think you can see there's an issue here. The issue is with the Department of Revenue that must change their methodology to be in line with the recent decisions of the tax court. What we like about this bill is that it puts the responsibility for paying the refunds on the, at the agency who caused the problem. Without modification, as you heard, the counties might have to levy for these refunds, and in effect, we would be paying our own refund. So I want to just urge you to advance the state pays proposal. Thank you, Ms. Wright. While we do have questions from members, we're going to hold off on that because we have a couple more testifiers. And I said we'd hear from all the testifiers first. We may have to delay discussion to another day. I'm sorry. Um, Madam Chair. It's a busy issue. Madam Chair, that was Madam just the case since we're, this meeting is done at 2.15 and it's clearly a very important topic. Just I may suggest that we lay this over for the next meeting to further this discussion. With the six testifiers, I don't think they'll have enough time. There's yeah. a suggestion you're the chairwoman. Yeah, thank you. We're going to hear from our testifiers, and um, this is being laid over for further discussion and, and consideration. So um, as we put together our division report, rec welcome to the committee. Uh, Mr. Zart, um, please introduce yourself for the record. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> uh, chair and members, my name is Shane Zart. I'm with Flaherty and Hood and represent the Coalition of Utility Cities. Um, as well as the as uh, Wright County on, on utility taxation related issues. And I do hope to be brief because I'm here today to reinforce a lot of what other testifiers have presented and uh, about the, the issues and the, their significance. And also uh, possibly I know at least one testifier rep, uh, presented that uh, the potential reach of, of this issue could be even, even greater in, in future years. Um, the, uh, the Coalition of Utility Cities in, in particular is a, a group of eight uh, cities that host the state's largest power plants, um, including uh, uh, Becker, Monticello, Red Wing, uh, Granite Falls, uh, Oak Park Heights, and others. Um, and uh, 
there's a letter included in your packet, both from the uh, Greg Brzezinski, the city administrator from, from Becker, and uh, the Wright County Board Chair Derek Vedich, who Wright County is the home to Monticello and its nuclear generating plant. And all of the plants in these communities are valued and assessed under the, the same uh, statutes and rules that have been the discussion of, uh, of this legislation. And uh, we thank Representative Sundin, the uh, co-authors, and, and the committee for, for discussing this issue because uh, gratefully, I, I think uh, our communities are, have not faced this issue just yet, and, and the, those counties with uh, significant pipeline property have been first. But, but uh, we've had every indication that, that the utility companies that operate, own and operate the, the plants in our communities, um, it, potentially in the next couple of years, could be uh, levying their own uh, uh, tax court challenges to, to their valuations as well. And uh, the impact would be significant. And, and the, the numbers, just to throw out a few of them, you know, the utility, state assessed utility property for the city of Becker makes up around 75% of the city's budget. Um, it's around uh, 50 and 60% for both the, the cities of Monticello and Red Wing. Um, Oak Park Heights is around 40% and, and other communities, those large facilities are, are similar, similarly situated. Um, I'll just conclude by, by emphasizing uh, something that's, that's noted in uh, the uh, letter from Mr. Brzezinski from the city of Becker and that a previous testifier noted is, is just how unique state assessed property is in that the, the local governments play no role in the, the assessment of the property, the valuation of the property. At the end of the day, they're given a number and, and uh, that's what they're, they're told by the state is the valuation of their plant. And similarly, if, if uh, the, the company brings a challenge in tax court, the, the local government is not uh, a party to that suit, they don't, they don't play a role in it. At the end of the day, they're, they're handed uh, a bill for the, the refund, as, you, as you've heard from, from many others. And in, in effect, our, the local governments are, are caught in the middle of a, a dispute that, that they aren't a party to, um, except uh, they are bear a big part of the results. So um, thank you again to the, the authors of this bill and the, the committee for hearing this. I'm happy to stand for questions, although I'm sure we're running out of time here. Thank you very much. And our last testifier is Joanna Byers from the Department of Revenue. Welcome. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is Joanna Bears, and I'm the Legislative Director for the Minnesota Department of Revenue. At this time, we reserve comment, but we look forward to working with our county partners and legislators on this topic. We will work to schedule a time to come back and provide an overview of the state assessed property system in Minnesota. Thank you. Thank you. Well, as you can tell, this is a, a major issue whose timing and complexity is significant. And um, we are going to pay attention to what's happening as it winds through the legal processes to see um, when it might come forward to us for um, resolving an issue. Any final comments, Representative Sundin? Thank you, Madam Chair. But until we meet again, I'd just like uh, members to uh, go back to their districts and uh, take a look at the, how many power lines they have running through their communities, how many pipelines they have uh, running through their communities, uh, the impact of uh, these court decisions could be monumental for every person, every representative in this room. So thank you very much. Thank you for bringing the issue forward. And with that, Representative Marquardt renews his motion that the bill be laid over for possible inclusion in the division report. And with that, the tax division is adjourned. Thank you.